Um, so yeah, thank you everyone for sticking around. I'm so excited to be talking about this. Um, just kind of love to talk about virus classification. It's kind of what gets me up in the morning. And so I'm gonna be telling you about a tool called the Contact 2, um, which um, myself and Hope and Jang developed in the Sullivan lab. So the first question I wanna to pose to everyone is how much of the virus sphere is really known? And here is a figure from the gut virome database paper. And you know, one would expect the gut um, microbiome, gut virome to be you know, somewhat well studied. And if we wanna highlight the references that are in this network, and each dot here, I should remind everyone, each dot is a virus um, and the little connections between them show some sort of relationship. Um, and there's 17,000 dots in front of you right now. And if we look at this from the species level, um, there's only about 2,200 RefSeq genomes in this network, in this graph, um, but over 15,000 um, viral populations that have you know, seemingly no hit to RefSeq. And if we look at this at the, uh, the genus level, we find out that we don't really know much more based on these references. In fact, if we look at the number of genera that are produced from uh, GVD genomes that also match to RefSeq, you find that there's only you know, a small percentage of overlap. All the rest of them, all the other um, uh, gray dots, we have no other taxonomic information. And so really the question here is, how do you handle viruses that have few or no database matches? As someone who got their PhD studying archaeal viruses, I can tell you how frustrating it is when you have a 15 KB genome that's fully complete, you blast it against NCBI in all the databases and you have zero query matches, not even some match to some hypothetical protein, you get nothing. Um, and so this issue, of course, we have a whole day about this. Virus classification is hard. Um, it's kind of why we're here and why we're all kind of trying to discuss this and as a field kind of move forward to figure this out. And so there've been a couple attempts over the years. Um, you've heard from the other speakers, um, a number of the other um, uh, tools, methods that have been developed over the years. And I just wanted to focus on um, two particular pieces of work one is uh, Rob um, Edwards and Forrest Rower's work, um, actually a couple of decades ago, uh, uh, weirdly enough. And what they decided to do was instead of looking at a single gene, um, they wanted to see if they could use multiple genes to um, infer taxonomy. And what they found is that if they looked at groups of genes or groups of related genes between different viruses, you could kind of group them into a tree. And it turns out that this um, isn't really a phylogenetic tree, um, but it shows the principle, the fact that you can group viruses together based on their shared protein content. Around the same time, uh, Jeffrey Lawrence and group were actually working on a kind of a similar methodology, similar theory. And if you would look at these five genomes, um, you would expect maybe the first two viral genomes that share you know, many of their genes together um, to be more related than let's say FD is to YP01, uh, the bottom phage. And you know, let's see how that works. Um, and so basically this, this whole methodology, this, the theory behind vContact is the more genes you share, the more likely you are to be related to each other. And let's go back to that example. So if you take these five viral genomes and try to group them by their shared genes, you would see that FD and M13 share three blocks of genes versus FD and M13, um, uh, sorry, uh, M13 and IKE, which only share one of them. And then if you look at IKE and I2-2, they share kind of sort of two groups of genes, whereas you know a third group, um, they don't. And so you would expect those top two viruses to be more related than the next two. And if you thought that, you would be right. Um, it turns out that the top two are in the same genus and the next two are in another genus. 
with the fifth gene, uh, fifth virus in a totally separate group. And so Gypsy Lima Mendez, um, maybe seven or eight years later, uh, six, six years later, decided to take this to the next step. They asked the question, well, what happens if we represent the shared genes or the genes that sh are shared between two viruses as a network with each dot representing a particular genome and each edge um, between them, each kind of line connecting those two dots um, as a representation of how many genes are shared. And as you can see, clearly I'm showing you a figure from a manuscript, from a paper, um, you can see that it worked. And when they did this, they just tested out this theory. Does this even work? Um, and they applied this to 277 viral genomes in RefSeq. But here's the thing, once you get something into a network or a graph, you can apply network-based cluster, clustering analytics to them. And they did this to this network and they found a pretty high degree of agreement between the clusters they were receiving and the um, uh, viral RefSeq at the genus level. And keep in mind, this is like decades ago. So um, this was, you know, kind of advanced for this time, being able to connect disparate groups of viruses spanning single-stranded and double-stranded DNA and RNA viruses was, was kind of crazy. Um, and so how does this actually work? And I'll try to briefly go through this because I never have enough time. If you represent each virus as a particular dot or a node, or if you're a network person, a vertex in a network. And so you have all of these different viruses in a particular data set that you're interested in. And the red viruses, the green viruses, and yellow viruses might, may or may not share any genes with each other. And then you compare their gene uh, and protein uh, similarities and how many genes are shared between each of them. And then you basically apply a kind of a formula probability calculation where you ask the question, what are the odds of sharing five genes the same five genes between two viruses versus the million genes that are in the total data set. And you find out that the chances of just randomly sharing those five are actually really, really rare. And so you can apply this to all of the gene content um, in your data set and apply that uh, formula to every pairwise relationship to construct this network. And keep in mind here that I have not mentioned references or databases yet because you, you don't need them. And Ho Bin Jang and myself um, decided to build a tool using this theory as our framework. So could we just you know, make a tool out of this? And so we applied this to viral RefSeq, um, similar, but we, instead of almost 300 genomes, we applied it to over 2000. When we published this um, a number of years ago, and it was the first tool to really be accessible, um, easy to use. Uh, it had a pretty high clustering accuracy at the uh, genus level, so it was accurate. Um, and it was scalable and automated. And up to this point, there was no like highly scalable, as in two or 3,000 genomes at one time, a method for classifying viruses, especially classifying totally novel viruses. And it was automated, so you could just throw this into a particular pipeline. And then we decided to put this tool and make it widely available on iVirus, uh, iVirus um, which is a resource for viral ecology researchers where they can process a viral metagenome from brow reads all the way to you know, temporal and spatial distributions, uh, taxonomic annotation, ecology information, um, basically everything you need from end to end um, to get a publication out. And vContact was just one of the many tools in this kind of toolkit that a viral ecology researcher now had um, in which they could get some taxonomic information for their data set. And so we noticed that there were a number of issues with vContact 1. We even you know, put that in the conclusions that there's some areas of this network that just aren't working out for us. And so for moving on to vContact 2, we wanted to try to address these issues. And as you can see here, um, is a what we call a PC um, uh, PC uh, module profile, 
where on one axis you have the number of genomes and um, on the top you have the PCs. So these are the shared genes. And we identified the fact that, oh, one second, let me back up. And each of these genomes have a specific, let's say taxonomy associated with them. And these are like references. Um, and so you notice that in this situation, this entire cluster was associated with one virus cluster. However, if you look at the PC profile, you notice that, wait, there's is this weird virus at the bottom. Um, why is this being classified here? Well, it might turn out that this particular viral genome has only has a few matches to this VC and nothing else. And so the clustering algorithm decided to throw this genome with this group because it didn't match to anything else. The second are what, call, what we call the overlapping genomes. That's where you have a particular virus group um, sharing multiple genes with different viral groups. And the classifier decided to um, just throw that, um, classify that in with um, maybe a particular group that had more connections. And then finally, um, the more troublesome group, uh, the multiple genera. That's where all of the genes, genomes in a particular cluster shared the majority of their genes. And so um, if you've studied archaeoviruses, you'll know that um, the Fusiliviridae share almost 50% of their gene content. And um, it would be hard for any automated method to try to solve this. And so what we did is, well, we recognized that it was the clustering algorithm that we used. So we switched to cluster one, which immediately identified outlier and overlapping genomes for us so that we could separate those from the rest of the analysis so that the user could then follow up and figure out, okay, you're connected to this particular virus group, but, um, but there could be something else going on that we need to be aware of. And then we actually added a uh, refinement step um, that actually uses um, hierarchical clustering and a distance-based approach to resolve um, what um, uh, distance-based metric to basically figure out using ICTV and the distances between those viral genomes to basically set a threshold to which we define a genus as. So every single VC and vContact2 goes through initially and gets uh, an initial cluster classification. And then it gets this post-refinement step where it basically looks at the, the RefSeq distances, let's say the ICTV distances between every virus in a genus and say, hey, there's a particular distance that, there, um, that we found. And we're going to apply it to all of these VCs. Um, and so we applied these new methods um, to a slightly larger data set of ICTV um, and RefSeq genomes. And we've improved the accuracy um, a few percent, um, which might not seem like a lot, but you know, the field's always trying to move forward and every percentage counts. And I can't describe this in too much detail, unfortunately, but green means good. Green means that these are areas that were problematic before, but they're no longer. And purple means that um, these are areas that we still need to work on. But then again, this represents a small percent, a very small percentage of the overall data set. And this was scalable. Keep in mind, this tool was developed a number of years ago. Um, so we need to keep on increasing this. At the time, 17,000 genomes was, was huge. Like that was the largest data set we could find. Um, and we've recently tested it to about 500,000 genomes, but not more. Um, unfortunately, there are some you know, limitations in the code um, so that you can't process millions of genomes, but um, you know, this for its time was really, really good and still is if you have any medium or large scale data set. You just can't handle the IMG scale data sets that are now coming out online. Uh, vContact2 also estimates uh, confidences. Um, so every single virus cluster has multiple types of confidences to um, guide the user into um, whether or not they should use a particular classification. And for this example, we have two well-defined virus clusters, but there's two little dots over here, two little contigs um, that we're not sure about. And it turns out that those were classified as outliers. Um, and so we want to be able to quickly identify and uh, you know, 
move those away so that you can focus just on, you know, in terms of automated taxonomic classification, just focused on those sequences that are clustered. Here is an example of a low confidence cluster. Um, and the first pass actually put these all in the same cluster, but these are multiple different genera. There's one, two, three, four, five different genera here. And vContact2 was able to identify um, that, hey, there's, there's, this is a low confidence. We don't have much confidence in these sequences. Um, and we can break these up into what we believe are genus level groups, but we want you, the user, to go in and manually identify them and uh, manually follow up with them. Um, and it's also interesting that vContact2 actually iterates with the ICTV. And when we were first developing um, vContact2, we actually noticed there were some areas, problematic areas of the network. And so we talked to ICTV and find out that, you know, vContact2 was actually able to identify some areas of the taxonomy that needed to be um, fixed. And so um, after we published vContact2, and we've recently updated vContact2 to include um, these new taxonomies, um, we improved the classification just by helping ICTV. Um, and then, of course, they helped us. It's a nice reciprocal relationship. Um, and vContact2 also lets you look at gene markers or gene cassettes. Um, so you could look at, for example, if you're interested in two virus groups, two VCs that have no information associated with them, they don't hit any, any, to anything in RefSeq, vContact2 still will cluster them and provide a high confidence prediction for that grouping. But then you could go in to that virus cluster and look at all the shared genes. You can look at the core genes, you can look at the niche defining genes, and you can follow up on that particular um, your subset of your data for more meaningful biological questions. That if you just relied on a, you know, a random classification against um, a gen bank and you got no matches or hypothetical proteins, you, you wouldn't know what to do with it. But at least this provides context for which to work. Um, vContact2 also incorporates a lot of community feedback in its development. Um, and I've answered way too many questions, hundreds of questions on Bitbucket and on protocols.io where we put all of our protocols. Um, and you'll see me responding to questions all of the time. Um, and if you have any questions, concerns, or whatever, just post them, and eventually I'll get to them. There's quite a few places um, that I'm lagging behind, but I always try to get back to them. And then I've mentioned before, but we put vContact on iVirus, um, or vContact2, I'm sorry, on iVirus, so that you can kind of plug into this, this set of resources um, in which to study your um, viral data set. We also have uh, v contact on cybers uh, through bioconda so that's a quick you know conda install v contact and bam it's installed to your server and then kbase as well so in conclusions uh, v contact 2 is great for known and unknown viruses it is broadly available uh, for the community and we try to incorporate as much feedback as we can in like i said development and then it's pretty scalable. Um, it does, I don't, I don't want someone to, you know, I wanna be honest and don't try to put 2 million genomes in here because it's not gonna work. Um, but it's not gonna work because of the software itself. It's gonna be like some hardware implementation stuff that we need to work through. Um, also acknowledging, I wanna acknowledge the NSF and the Moore Foundation um, for their funding for both, you know, vContact 1 and 2. And then also for the Sullivan Lab members who were actually the real, you know, the people who, uh, if I have any issues, um, initially with the alpha prototypes, um, they're the ones that have to suffer through, you know, coming back and forth between me and them. And then also I wanna highlight Olivier Zablocki and Hoban Jang who have been with me from the beginning. Um, they're my co-authors for um, vContact 1 and 2. And then also uh, Dean and Simon, um, who's mentioned, who's also a panelist um, for their you know, helpful feedback and suggestions and development, as well as Cybers and KBase, you know, without their assistance, I would never be able to put vContact on their infrastructures, as well as ICTV for helping us work through some of um, taxonomy issues. And then of course, everyone here, the community, um, I think I actually saw a couple people um, attending today that are, have mentioned, have asked questions on Bitbucket and on protocols. So 
I'm excited to kind of meet you in person um, rather than, you know, texts um, online. And so uh, with that, that's kind of my end. And uh, I'll welcome to take any questions. Uh, thanks a lot, Ben. Um, this was a great presentation. I am going to um, ask you one question from the chat, um, and then we can move towards the, the panel discussion more. And the one that is currently the highest uploaded is, would the contact to be effective in classifying NCLDVs, considering them chimeras, many genes of different origins? So the large um, DNA viruses of I mean um, so those can actually be a kind of problematic um, and they're problematic for the reason that they can share quite a few genes with a lot of the more genes that you share with in a group um, will um, kind of mess with the clustering algorithm and so if you have multiple N and DCLVs, I always get that acronym wrong. Um, large viruses, yeah. giant viruses. <laughs> yes. um, if you have multiple genera of those, the contact two might not be able to distinguish them. Um, but I try not to promote B contact for anything less than the genus level. So okay. upper taxonomic ranks. So, so would it be possible to if you have the correct reference database of NCLDVs to, to pinpoint and say this contact is part of an NCLDV? Oh yeah, oh, of course, I'm sorry. Yeah, I um, yeah. so you would be able to identify it as an NCLDV, um, <laughs> as a giant virus. As a giant virus. Um, if yeah. you had the appropriate references for it. Would it um, be a low quality region of the network? Probably, um, but you would be able to, as an example, um, all of them, the giant viruses might be in a particular group off by themselves. Um, I can't, I wish Hobin was here. He, he actually has gone <laughs> through every single um, virus in this network, all 2000 of them and their taxonomies and their confidence levels. So he'd be able to like immediately tell you yes or no for everyone, but. Okay, uh, thanks a lot.